Welcome to Sell Smarter, Sell Faster, a podcast dedicated to helping sales organizations grow. Each week, we discuss proven sales enablement strategies and real life examples with experts and thought leaders from across industries. I'm your host, Danny Buckley, Vice President and General Manager at Lead G2, a sales performance agency. In this episode, we're discussing how to ensure your salespeople are actually using the sales content that has been created for them. Here, we ask questions like, why is content important to prospects and customers? Does it even make a difference? Why does sales content often remain unutilized by salespeople and what can we do about it? And what elements should be in place in order for sales to make the best use of marketing content? Joining me to answer those questions and so many more is Phyllis Davidson, VP, Principal Analyst at Forrester. Phyllis brings up some great insights like why sales reps who make use of content perform better than their peers, how too many sellers are left confused about when to use certain pieces of content, and just as importantly, where to access them. And lastly, why strengthening the relationship between marketing and sales can only result in stronger and more helpful content for sellers and prospects alike. All right, Phyllis, I am so happy you're here with us today. Um, I first came across you when we both spoke at the B2B Marketing Exchange. Yes. So um, thank you for joining. How are you? Absolutely. Good, good. Thank you so much for having me. It's, this is a important topic. Um, and I think, as I mentioned to you, it's something we're going to be uh, talking about. We have a session on basically how sales should use marketing content at our upcoming uh, summit in a couple of weeks in Austin. So, yeah, I love it. I know when we were talking about what to talk about, we both were excited because this was just perfect, perfect for the yeah. podcast, timely, um, something that I know we talk about and teach often at Lead G2. So um, let's jump in. So absolutely. Yeah. We're going to talk about how to really get content used effectively by salespeople. Um, and we're talking about all kinds of content, right? Specifically marketing content, but also sales enablement content, often a lots of overlap there. Um, so just to start, what is it about this topic that makes it kind of so important to you? And can you give us like just a few examples of the kind of content we might just be talking about? So people are all on the same page. Okay. So first of all, when we're talking about business to business sales, which are generally, you know, have a longer, um, longer lead time. You've got to keep somebody engaged with you for a while before you sell to them. You're not selling to one peop one person, right? You're generally mm -hmm. selling to a buying group. Um, sales needs to have a way to keep engaging with people. So marketing is certainly in the business of coming up with a story that they're pushing out through marketing channels to keep people engaged. But at some point, it makes so much sense for sales to pick up that conversation, insert themselves, and be the ones that share that content that marketing has created for the external audience, but for sales to share that with appropriate context for that client, right? What better reason for a sales rep to reach out than to share something that's come across in content? Yes. Um, so, and it's, you know, something we did a number of years ago, um, I, I keep hoping that our sales enablement team will update this research because as a person who, uh, you know, manages content strategy and operations um, in the forester business, to me, this was fascinating. And it was basically a what winners do study that we did a number of years ago in terms of what's the difference between sales reps who share content created by marketing and sales reps who don't. Hmm. And I think the other thing that's clustered in here is sales reps who are really tuned into using social effectively to reach their hmm. prospects and their customers. And what we discovered was um, some pretty interesting data points about the fact that sales reps who use content perform better than their peers. Um, and th there's a logic to this, right? Because again, if you can really connect your conversation to something uh, that you can leave behind with someone, and I'm not talking product brochure here, I'm talking about audience-centric kinds of content. Yeah. Certainly, this all becomes very obvious when we get to the bottom of the funnel and you know, a customer is actually asking a sales rep for product information. That's low-hanging fruit. What I'm talking about, though, is putting out there and sharing. It's and the the onus is on marketing to make sure sure that this kind of external marketing content for uh, our external audiences is effectively shared with sales, and that sales is empowered to use it. This is what's 
so important. So you asked yeah. what kind of content we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. So, and I would argue, I mean, it could be any kind of asset, but when we think about what's inside the content, so whether it's an ebook or um, a blog or a thought leadership paper, whatever it is, doesn't matter as much what the asset is. It matters what's in it. Mm. And what can be so effective for sales to share is something that combines um, facts about the industry that demonstrate that the vendor is knowledgeable and can be a trusted supplier of information, right? That's one element in content that's really yeah. great for sales to use. So actual data about what's going on in the industry together with that thought leadership. So content that demonstrates the company's thought leadership. And there's a real opportunity here for a sales rep to plug into the, those thought leadership ideas. And again, put it in context yes. for the, uh, you know, the prospect or customer that they're sharing it with. It provides an opportunity for a conversation, right? Yeah. Customer stories are important as well. So I will often talk about, well, this, all of these things could be inside an ebook. Um, an interactive ebook, perhaps, that allows uh, a prospect to go in and out of, you know, deep dive on different pieces of information. Um, again, what's critical here too is that sales is properly empowered to use the content. So we can talk about that a little bit too. But yeah. let me let you uh, keep asking no. questions. No, it's great. It's great, and I, I love that you touched on like adding the context. I just think that's such an important piece. Um, and we will, we'll talk more. So, um, you know, I know because I hear it all the time. I talk to, to business leaders and sales leaders of all types um, that sometimes they are skeptical about how much content really matters in the sales process. Um, they're not used to that. They're not used to, they haven't transitioned to the world that we, we are all expected to be content providers and educators. Um, so how important do you think it actually is the prospects and customers? Does it really make a difference? Like, what do you know that we can help maybe convince some of those folks a little more that this matters? Okay. So I have a great data point for you. In fact, I'm right. bringing it up in front of me so yes. I can grab it. So we um, do a study every year where we talk to businesses about their consumption of content from the vendors who are trying to sell to them, the vendors they are already using. And we ask a set of deep questions about the value of the content. And the responses are, are actually pretty daunting. I'm, I'm going to share one specific data point, but there are many more data points regarding the fact that overall, folks don't think the content they get from vendors is very good. They get too mm -hmm. much. It, um, it is all looks, you know, no meat in there, you know, mm -hmm. too, too much of a uh, high level overview that isn't really demonstrating an understanding of customer needs. But here's the, the most interesting factoid. We asked the question of um, how likely are you to continue to do business with a vendor whose content you don't find valuable? And almost 70% of respondents said that they were unlikely to expand contracts with vendors who simply did not provide good content. Mm, That's a yeah. really interesting data point. Yeah. Um, and concerning, right? Because so many of us are in, uh, you know, businesses where it's not so much about selling the first time. It, it's about retaining customers, right? Yeah. So that content machine uh, and not only the machine for just getting content to um, externally out there through a variety of channels to your audiences, but as part of that machine, empowering sales to use that content, not just for new business, but in their ongoing communications with existing customers, it's so critical. And um, it's something that as a, you know, a, a content expert, I certainly champion. And I do think the onus, um, the initial onus is on marketing to provide those materials that support the content that makes it easy and possible for sales reps and other customer uh, facing, you know, account team members, CSMs, et cetera, to effectively share the content. Yeah, great. Yes, love it. And I love the, the emphasis on they care about good content, right? It's not, we're not talking about just the content that I think a lot of salespeople are used to of like how explaining your product or service. <laughs> we're talking no. about the content that's helpful and educational. 
So what I, um, you know, my main goal for our whole team on content strategy and operations in Forrester is trying to um, help our clients um, on the business side to develop audience centric yeah. content and absolutely step away from this product promotional type of content that companies have always developed. And you'd be yeah. surprised as much as we've been talking about, you know, being audience centric for years, it's still really hard for a lot of companies. And a lot of companies are just so product driven yeah. that it's still an internal struggle, but it's yeah. up to the content team to, to reinterpret you know, the story that needs to be told to make it audience centric. I say the content team, so many people are involved, yeah. marketers, demand, brand, ABM, right? There's a lot of discussion about yeah. based uh, content and content strategy. So in fact, that's one of the things um, or, or an area of work that content teams have to provide is if I'm, um, I need to understand what the sales plays are. And let's say I've developed content that's appropriate for um, an, our account-based marketing focus, but also for other focus areas. It, you know, perhaps that piece is meant to cover a specific geo, et cetera. So when I provide empowerment materials to sales, I need to segment it to match their sales plays, mm. right? And yeah. You could argue that in addition to the external customer content being audience centric, our enablement to the sales team needs to be audience centric. Yes. I need yeah. to give sales what they need in their context. Yeah. So this is a perfect transition because my next question is, why do we think salespeople aren't using the marketing assets and content that we create for them? What are, what are the problems we're facing? Okay. So one of the things we see is that sales is confused about what the heck to use and where to yeah. go to find it. So um, some of our stats, and I'm just looking right now at some of the, the figures that I have from uh, recent studies, um, there's like 1,100 assets available to the average seller to pick from. That's crazy, right? We yeah. need to make it easy for them by promoting specific content. Um, they also... Many sellers say that what they've got in terms of sales tech to help them get to the right mm -hmm. content isn't yeah. very good. They need easier ways to access the content. Um, they also will find that they just don't think the content fits, right? That they feel like they have to rewrite an asset or re re uh, write the enablement around the asset. Let's mm -hmm. say the email that marketing provides to go with it because it doesn't fit what they're going after at yeah. all. Uh, and then too often, you know, marketing might be pushing the same content for too broad a range of deal types or persona types, buying groups, et cetera. So it's fine tuning and really creating the content for the content. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say that can yeah. make a different difference plus the technology. So certainly your audience is familiar with all of the sales content solutions that are out there, right? It's become over the last 10 years, technology, and I'm talking about, you know, seismic, big tin can, those kinds of technologies. Um, marketing is investing in them because uh, it's so critical to their success with sales that even though I, I remember when this area of technology came out a dozen years ago or so, I thought, well, isn't it up to sales enablement to actually make this purchase? Doesn't it come out of the sales enablement budget? And what we've seen over time is this is a marketing expenditure too, because it's so critical. So all of the problems I just mentioned can be solved through effective use of a sales content solution, yeah. right? Because yeah. One of the, in fact, one of the places where we see modular content and a, a, a really powerful recommendation engine really taking hold is within those sales content solutions. Yeah. Because one of the first things we've seen happen is a much more effective use of modules so that just from a pure enablement standpoint, presentations that sales needs to put together for customers um, our capabilities are really strong in this area to provide the different modules that a sales rep can easily pick from. Again, yeah. when it's done right, it's not like it's necessarily easy to put this together, but companies that are doing a really great job in utilizing these solutions make it easy for sales reps to pull together their presentations that they need 
um, because they've been uh, basically added to the engine in a modular way. And the engine is driven by AI that can help put together and assemble, construct those presentations. I love but it. In, yeah. Right? Yeah. But in addition to that, you know, you, what you want to happen is for sales reps to go in and say, okay, I'm looking at this kind of deal. Um, this is essentially where um, my persona of this type is in the sales cycle. This is the problem they're having. What content should I be sending? And mm. they should be able to pull that out of the system. And along with the actual content is, again, what I call the content for the content, the email, right? the social blocks, uh, the call script. Um, and those things, they, it, it shouldn't be just one thing for each asset. Yeah, The marketing team should have thought through, well, there, what are all the use cases for the use of this? And let me make sure that we're providing um, what's needed. The other thing too, is that this isn't something that marketing should be doing for every single asset that they're churning out, right? Part of the challenge here is saying, what is the right content? Again, I mentioned those 1,100 assets. Well, you also can't be recommending 500 assets. You've got to have um, an engine that you know is using intelligence to get to the right asset, or at least a short list, right? You don't want sales to have to spend time to try to choose. You want to try to get them what they need as easily as possible. Yeah, yes, love it. And I think... I love that you're mentioning technology, super important. Um, lot That could be a whole other episode. <laughs> um, but also I love, you know, a lot of what you spoke to is that, I, mean, I think a lot can be boiled down to, are you actually having conversations and understanding the needs of your sales force, right? Because it's like, yeah. you're like, they're, they're don't think it's that valuable or they're having to edit it too much or they can't find it or they don't actually have the things they need. And so I think it's just a great reminder to those listening that, this marketing can't just be making these decisions in a silo, right? There that has is to be a so lot of right. So in the session that I'm doing with my um, colleague, Peter Ostro, who is just an expert in sales enablement. And, you know, after we do this session, I'll, I'll push out some social linking uh, to his stuff as well and to the session we're presenting. But one of the things we're going to talk about is the feedback loop. And there's a real yeah. problem here if marketing doesn't have an open channel with sales. Now, sure, there are in large companies, there is some methodology for getting that feedback in more of a process oriented way. But I'm a big fan of just talking to sales, right? If marketing should have, you know, a sample set of representative, not only account representatives, but basically people in all of the customer facing roles that they're talking to regularly to keep their pulse on their needs, their issues, what they think is working and what isn't. And then here's the other really important thing. So these systems that we were talking about, the sales content solutions, one of the things they do that's so critical, again, if used properly, is they record and make it possible for marketers to see when an asset has been shared by sales and engaged with mm, or yes. shared directly through a marketing channel. That is absolutely critical because at the end of a half year, if you can see that you've got a very specific set of content that sales has shared and through sales sharing, that's content that's getting engaged with, that is a critical piece of content planning information. In yeah. fact, that's actually, there's another session I'm doing. Um, you'll appreciate this uh, coming from where you are in all of this stuff. It's called Look Back to See Ahead. And it's a session on looking at content engagement from the standpoint of late stage pipeline and closed one deals and tracking back. Oh, yeah to see what everyone engaged in. And one of the examples I use there in terms of the kind of thing you might find is, hey, we put an asset out there that we thought we'd get a lot of pickup in certain channels. And guess what we learned? The best pickup was when sales shared the asset. Yes. Right? It's That's true. a really yeah. important learning. But we still hear all the time yeah. from companies that eh, what sales does is they download the asset and they send it an email. And that's a huge loss of a piece of information. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. Love it. Okay. Yes. I, um, so I know that you all in, in this presentation you're doing kind of on this topic, you have some key elements that you've put together of kind of what should be in place for sales to make the best use of marketing content. So 
tell us, walk us through those, those key elements that people should be thinking about. Well, we put together kind of a, a, a schema, if you will, of six yeah. essential elements. Yeah. And um, we, we, we sort of made it simple by just calling it the, the what, the why, the when, the whom, the how, and the ROI. Great. And I'll just <laughs> cover this at kind of a high level. So the, the what is, you have to start out with the right set of content. And like I said, it shouldn't be just any old asset and it should by no means be all assets. This should be where the what is chosen based on, you know, it being an area, a current campaign that's strongly connected to current sales plays where there's a lot of heat and light. <clears throat> you also, it's not like you want sales to be a channel that sort of picks up um, the ability to share content because you don't have enough marketing channels to share it. That's not really the right choice. What you should be doing is giving sales something that you expect to be really popular. And even if you're putting it out through multiple marketing channels, honestly, if if a uh, end customer gets something from sales that they've actually seen a banner ad for or whatever, that's good. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Um, and if they get it a second time from sales, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, yet, yes, it certainly you may want to provide certain unique things, but again, it should be the popular content that the heat and light is on. And it should be a set of assets, hopefully. So one of the big things we talk about um, is that uh, marketing teams should be using a primary and derivatives content approach. So there's a big primary asset that's robust in what's inside of it. And then there are a bunch of derivatives that yeah. may be more appropriate for different audience members because of the focus, but they're pulling the content from the bigger piece. So the best thing to do in terms of the what <clears throat> is to give sales the full package and be and be able to give them some instruction on, hey, if you're talking to this person in the buyer group, you may be better off using um, the blog as opposed to the white paper or whatever yeah. it is. Um, the other thing uh, is the why. So whereas you, you don't want to you know, be saddling the sales rep with your whole marketing plan around the content, you do need to give them information about why this content is relevant, specific to the personas, to the buying group, to your solutions. You need the short set of messaging and you know, goals with the content that mm -hmm. sales can uh, you know, grok quickly. Again, not some big long document, yeah. but enough so that they understand why this is the right content. And then when, when is the right time to share it? So there should, it should be clear when uh, something is pr appropriate for what stage in the buyer journey. And by the way, that's also something that's very important from a feedback standpoint, yeah. because what if sales disagrees and says, you know what, I've been sharing this, but it really is more bottom of the funnel. And you're telling me it's the first thing to share that right there, you know, will help marketing do a better job with this when in the future in developing future content. Um, and again, for whom? So, and, and there's two angles on this for whom, because yes, it's make sure you've parsed your personas enough uh, and, and also provided, you know, the appropriate emails, et cetera, depending on what persona content is going to. But the other thing is the enablement material. So what the, the whom from the standpoint of your sales team, the way you enable a BDR may be different than the way that you enable an account manager or a CSM. So it's important that the marketing team is thinking through that as well. And then the how really is what does that full package of supporting materials uh, include, right? So you've got the asset or set of assets itself, which I'll call above the glass. That's what the end customer is going to see. And then you've got all the supporting assets that provide the how, how sales can effectively share the content. We've kind of talked about that. So there's a diverse set of materials. And then the ROI, um, which is kind of the last of our six essential elements, is being able to follow and see when content has been shared by sales and that's been successful based on the engagement you see uh, um, among the audience. Mm -hmm. So getting that feedback loop is critical as well. And um, I, I love that we're doing the session on this topic at Summit, as well as my um, session on the content touch analysis, which, you know, 
is directly related to that yeah. ROI. Um, yeah. So, so anyway, there, the six elements. No, that's great. Is there anything else we should know about ROI? Anything else that you recommend when it comes to like ensuring it, tracking it? <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. Um, one of the things about ROI is that ROI on content is about engagement and influence. Mm. It is not about creating a lead or closing a piece of business. And I mean, certainly salespeople understand that content isn't going to close a piece of business. Um, but we still see a lot of yeah. <laughs> sort of marketing funnels that suggest that there's this moment in time when content opens a door or closes a door. And you know, sure, you could set things up that way by gating content and having that content is downloaded and bam, that person gets a call from sales. But that doesn't usually work, right? Yeah. Um, what we're trying to help marketers do is create a whole schema for engagement where we're um, basically looking at all of the sensors that are enabled through the whole marketing stack. And by the way, sales sharing is another place where you have a sensor that will pick up a signal from the audience regarding what they're doing and what they want to engage with. You want to build content engagement that's based on collecting signals and fine tuning an experience in a personalized way based on those signals. So ROI needs to be about driving engagement that ultimately um, has a relationship to, biz to pipeline and closed business. It's not about a, you know, a one-to-one -one relationship between content and leads. So I hope yeah. that makes sense. It makes total sense. And I think it's, it's probably one of the most important things folks should hear from this. <laughs> Cause I think it is often we're looking for that like direct ROI and this thing. And it's just, that's just not how it works. And, no, and, and it's, yeah, it's you're going to lose that battle <laughs> and then you're going to give up on doing things that actually really matter and do make an impact. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, um, we at Forrester, we've been talking about the, the criticality of the buying group in mm. B2B sales for a number of years. But it's a big change from a sales operations standpoint, you know, in terms of the way the waterfall is um, looked at, measured, uh, and, and just frankly, the way it works. So we're seeing it slowly really take hold, but it's a hard change. So, it, you know, when, if you're in an organization where um, you know, a piece of content is being depended on to equal a lead that is a single individual. And now we're going to, you know, count that among all of our leads in a given quarter, when in fact, that potential piece of business is actually represented by six individuals for that one piece of business. So those six leads are really one lead. And yeah. it's not a piece of a single piece of content that's going to somehow yeah. move them from pipeline to close deal. So there's, there's a lot more complexity in the way all of this works in B2B. I often will say to people, Hey, we're not selling a pair of pants, Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, online where, Hey, this person looked at Brown pants. Now let's send them ads for blue pants and see what we're, <laughs> we're talking about. So much more complexity, you yeah. know, it's hard. Um, but one of the great things that marketing can do is to work closely with sales in this way and make sure that they're creating content that's useful to that sales conversation. Yeah. Great. I love this. I love your passion. I love your expertise. Um, this you. is such an important topic. And um, so just, but we do have to, we do have to close out, even though yep. I could sit and chat all day. <laughs> um, any closing thoughts, anything we haven't covered that you want to be sure our listeners know before we, we say goodbye. Um, let's see. I would say that, you know, be willing, and this is to your sales audience, feel like you have an open door, even, even if you don't, if you don't know the people in marketing, mm -hmm. producing content, go figure out who they are. Tell them if you think something is good, or if you think something's bad, looked at what, look at what marketing is putting out and, uh, in terms of blogs and on LinkedIn and reshare and, you know, get to know your marketers a little bit, you may be able to get more out of them than you, than you realize in ways that are really helpful to your job every day. Yeah. Love that. Great advice. Um, well, thank you so much, Phyllis. It's so nice to connect with you. I appreciate your time. Absolutely.
And uh, for those listening, we'll have Phyllis's contact information in the show notes, um, along with some other links that I know you're going to share with us um, to, to pass along for people to get more information on this topic. And um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Sell Smarter, Sell Faster. And until then, happy selling. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Sell Smarter, Sell Faster. If you like what you hear, click that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Be sure to visit our website, sellsmartersellfaster.com, where you can find even more helpful sales enablement and inbound marketing content. 